This meeting is being recorded. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Catherine Dougal, and I am the Development and Engagement Specialist at Bridge Michigan. Today, we'll be discussing invasive species in the Great Lakes. This event is part of a collaboration between Bridge Michigan and Circle of Blue. And this is part of a bi-monthly discussion series sponsored by the Herb Foundation and Bosch Foundations, where we will be discussing issues related to the Great Lakes and Great Lakes conservation. I want to remind you that this event is being recorded. So if you're not able to stay with us the whole time, or if you'd like to share it with someone, you'll be able to view this on Bridge Michigan tomorrow. If you're not familiar with Bridge, we are a nonprofit, nonpartisan statewide news organization, and you can read our coverage for free every day online. The schedule for today's discussion is that we'll begin with a conversation between Bridge Michigan reporter Kelly House and our three special guests we'll be introducing in just a moment. And we will then be opening the discussion to reader questions for our panelists. I would like to remind you that if you have questions for our panelists, you can drop them into the chat on Zoom anytime during this conversation. We are asking that people stay muted. If you're calling in today, you can email your questions to us at membership at bridgemi.com. And I will now be introducing our special guests. So first today we have Doug Craven. Doug Craven is joining us from the Little Traverse Bay Bands of Ottawa Indians. And Doug feels that the effective management of natural resources involves understanding human dynamics as much as natural systems. He is committed to the Natural Resource Community of Michigan and has been on various boards committees, including the Great Lakes Leadership Academy Board, the 2011 MSU Environmental and Natural Resource Governance Fellow, Getting Kids Outdoors, Emmett County, Great Lakes Fishery Trust Board, Pelston Planning Commission, and has 20, over 20 years of private and public experiences in natural resources. Doug also has a dual degree in natural resource management and environmental studies from Western Michigan University. And as a father, dedicated community member and avid outdoorsman who appreciates exercising tribal treaty rights and continuing tribal traditions with his children and family. We are also joined today by Dr. Rochelle Studevant, who serves as program manager for NOAA's Great Lakes Aquatic Non-Indigenous Species Information System. This searchable database provides species profiles, threat assessments, and maps designed to improve stakeholder education and inform prevention, management, and control of aquatic non-indigenous species, also ca called aquatic invasive species. Rachel's, Rochelle's position allows her to work collaboratively with Michigan Sea Grant, Michigan State University Extension, and the NOAA Great Lakes Environmental Research Laboratory to understand and combat Great Lakes invaders. Rochelle has a PhD in systems ecology from Kent State University. Last but not least, we're joined by Peter Alsip today, who is an ecological modeling data, data analyst at the University of Michigan's Cooperative Institute for Great Lakes Research. Peter uses numerical ecological models to study different aspects of the Great Lakes ecosystem. In collaboration with scientists from Sigler and NOAA's Great Lakes Environmental Research Laboratory, Peter applied a model to evaluate habitat sustainability for invasive bighead and silver carp in Lake Michigan, which demonstrated that the lake was more suitable than previously thought. This research, which was published in 2019 in the journal Freshwater Biology, demonstrated that low food availability in the lake's offshore waters, waters is an unlikely insufficient barrier to establishment. In a follow-up study published in Biological Invasion, Invasions in 2020, Peter and colleagues evaluated how certain types of human activity, including climate change, nutrient load management, and the introduction of dry scene mussels affects Lake Michigan sustainability for big head and silver carp. I'm now going to pass it on to our resident invasive species expert at Bridge Michigan environment reporter, Kelly House. Uh, thanks, Catherine, and thanks, uh, Doug, Rochelle, and Peter for being here and lending your expertise. Um, obviously, invasives are always a timely discussion because it feels like we're constantly hearing about new ones and dealing with the ones that are already here. Um, 
but in particular right now, because there's all this uh, Great Lakes Restoration Initiative money coming in, some of which we'll, we'll be addressing invasives. Um, and I think, Doug, was it one of your staff who discovered the recent discovery of rock snot emerging in the Lower Peninsula? Yes. Yep. Uh, he he was uh, he's an average fisherman, so he was on the uh, I believe the Manistee uh, or one of the branches of that, and uh, yeah, he he did encounter that and document it for the first time in Michigan. Unfortunately, yes. So always an evolving issue. Um, well, I want to start with just some grounding questions and maybe go to Rochelle because I know Rochelle, you are sort of the keeper of the database of what's out there and what we're worried about arriving here. Um, can you give us some context on how prevalent invasive species are in our region, aquatic invasives, and who's here now that's really causing a lot of damage? Um, and how many, on average, new species come in and, and get a foothold each year in, in our region? Sure. So our database, uh, NOAA's Great Lakes Aquatic Non-Indigenous Species Information System, we currently track about 188 non-native species that have established populations in the Great Lakes. Um, about a third of those meet the definition of invasive in that they're documented to cause some level of harm to native species or to our human socioeconomic uses of the Great Lakes resources. Um, we started tracking these species in the 1990s. So at the peak of the invasion, um, in the late 90s, the invasion rate we estimated was 2.6 species per year. Um, so thanks to the stronger regulation targeting prevention, early detection, rapid re response, we've brought that rate down remarkably and we have not had a new invader become established in the Great Lakes since 2016. Um, so that's like more than a tenfold decrease in the number of species invading. We do, still, however, still have a lot of species that are right on our doorstep um, that have established populations just outside of the Great Lakes. Um, these are identified in trade. They're showing up only to be wiped out when we get a harder winter. Um, and we currently track about 89 of these watch list species. And that's a lot of species. I imagine they can do varying levels of damage. Um, can each of you speak to, and I know that you you exist in different realms and, and different parts of the state, what do you see as the top threats um, to Michigan? Do you want me to start? Sure, go for it, Rochelle, and then maybe we'll pass the baton. All right, so it's, it's a hard question to start with because it really depends on what criteria you're looking at for top threats. So obviously there's species like the quagga mussel that have grown in debt, you know, they're already here, they're already established. They've grown in population density to the point where they're blanketing the bottom of the Great Lakes. They're having huge impacts. Um, they're clogging infrastructure like water intake pipes, which costs tens of thousands, if not millions of dollars every year to keep them cleared off of um, infrastructure to the point that we can actually, you know, still use the resources of the Great Lakes. Um, or we could talk about the established species that have made major leaps in their footprints in the last decade. So we've got about 23 species in the Great Lakes that you know, some of them have been here for a very long time, but in the last decade, they've jumped, say, from Lake Ontario to Lake Huron. Um, European frogbit would be an example of that group of species. Um, or we have species like hydrilla that just showed up in the Niagara River this year. Uh, water sh soldiers showed up in the Bay of Quinte. Um, so those are brand new invasions um, that we don't know yet whether they're established or not, but they've just shown up in the Great Lakes. Um, and then personally to me, um, I'm really concerned about the species that we don't study very well. Um, things like parasites and fish diseases and plant diseases and um, all of those um, species, you know, that there just aren't enough scientists out there studying them to even know whether they're a risk or not. 
Um, and I'll turn it over to someone else for their list of high risks. Yeah, I, I guess I'll um, echo a lot of what Rochelle said. I think in terms of established species, it's hard to talk about invasive species in the Great Lakes without mentioning the quagga mussels. Uh, they've forever changed the landscape of, or the seascape of the Great Lakes uh, in many different ways. Um, but in terms of, I think maybe um, ones that aren't as ubiquitously established as those, uh, I, I focus on a much more narrow range of taxa than Rochelle. I, um, I focused on invasive carp and uh, the grass carp uh, are one of these species that have, uh, we've recently discovered have reproducing populations in some tributaries of, the, of Western Lake Erie. Um, and they have a potential to have very broad ranging effects because um, they consume uh, macrophytes or plants that grow on the bottom of the lakes, uh, which support habitat and food for a variety of species, not just fish, um, but macroinvertebrates and also uh, waterfowl as well. So they could have a potentially very broad ranging impact on the ecosystem. Yeah, I would say for, for us there, I mean, obviously the, some of the well-established ones, so sea lamprey, um, you know, continue to be uh, an issue as far as affecting fisheries um, in the Great Lakes. Uh, they're being managed to a certain degree right now, but really that's a product of funding. Um, and at this point, uh, they're not developing resistance to lamprecide treatments that are being applied to them. Uh, so I think lamprey are always going to be something that uh, are kind of there lurking in, in the, the recesses. Uh, obviously, quagga mussels. Uh, I think one that we're keeping an eye on as well is uh, um, L-life. So another one seemingly under control, but a, a, again, it really has a product to do with how you manage the fishery here um, in terms of that invasive species um, and what type of management decisions uh, the managers are making in terms of uh, salmon uh, versus a native species, uh, lake trout. So I think those are some specific ones that we're watching right now, certainly, um, or continue to be concerned about, but also uh, I would echo disease. I think that's the, the next type of thing there uh, that's going to be uh, on the radar is these other things that are very hard uh, to visualize and um, to inspect. Um, so it's gonna be disease, I think is, is certainly something that we're concerned about. And Doug, you just touched on something that I, I think about a lot when I think about invasives, which is the hard to visualize. And you know, when we think about environmental threats like an oil spill or you know, a dramatic, a dam break, something like that, you see the effects immediately. Invasives, I mean, I've been guilty of taking a picture of a pretty plant and then later realizing that it is actually an invasive that choked out you know, that particular area. Um, so I guess my point is they can be viewed as maybe less significant or, or less visible. Can each of you speak to you know, why these are an important problem and what's the risk to our region um, with some of these things? And I imagine you can each speak to it from different perspectives. I know that Doug, um, for the Little Traverse Bay Band, you know, you have tribal fisher, you know, anglers who are directly affected. And I know that Rochelle, you um, provided some stats on like the economic impacts to me in the past. And Peter, with your work on carp, uh, I know you've done some predictive work on what could happen. So, so I'll start with Doug, because we're still on you. Um, can you speak to what's the, why should people care, you know, about the proliferation of these things? Yeah, absolutely. So I think invasive species, um, you know, are the biggest threat right now, in addition to climate change uh, to the Great Lakes. And that is something that is, is manageable. That's within our ability to, to help manage through better regulation, um, but through, uh, through being diligent as well. The impacts to us, though, here in Michigan, uh, you know, one of the things that, you know, we appreciate about being out here um, is our, our, our lakes, right? So there is an industry that's around, uh, developed around fishing, so commercial fishing, recreational fishing, um, those combined now are about a $17 billion uh, enterprise um, in the Great Lakes. Also our tourism, you know, depend on having uh, water quality, clean beaches, those types of things. Um, and so invasive species have the ability to, to impact both of those, I think in, in dramatic ways. Uh, we're seeing that specifically with fishing, um, so recreational fishing and also commercial fishing. Uh, you know, those are part of uh, the community fabric uh, of Northern Michigan. Those are part of our, our, our identity. Um, you know, individuals coming to our community or our tribal members here eating fish from a cultural or subsistence type of purpose, 
you know, those are part of our community um, in terms of whitefish being available or lake trout or those types of things. Uh, so it's that identity. So I think there's that threat there, but also I think there's some other things that people don't typically look at, maybe even from a tourism aspect. Um, many people come now to the, the Great Lakes here and you can look out, out into Lake Michigan and it looks like the Caribbean. It's a uh, crystal blue, clear water. You can see you know, 30 to 60 feet down in certain places. That's not a, an example of a healthy ecosystem. Uh, that's an example of a devoid system similar to a distilled glass of water. Um, you hold it up, there aren't these macro or micronutrients or your macro and, or micro invertebrates in there uh, that are the basis of the food chain. So that's very disruptive in terms of fishing, but also that allows more surface area of the lakes um, to have you know, cladoptera or other things grow there that can in turn turn into uh, beach following episodes where that becomes removed or washed off and then occupies and follows certain aspects of our beach, specifically in low water conditions. Uh, that can be a real condition um, aesthetically, but also from an environmental aspect as well. So I think these all relate and have the same basic cause um, at this point, it, it's, you know, invasive species are, are really impacting uh, the way we do things here, uh, but also the future of our Great Lakes too, so. And do we have a way of quantifying that sort of risk um, with dollars and cents? Rochelle, I wonder if you can speak to that. There are folks working on that. It's very, very difficult. Um, usually, you know, if we're talking about um, human infrastructure, that's easier to quantify, you know, the value of what does it cost per year to clean zebra mussels off of a water intake. It might be $100,000 for some of the larger water in intake plants, like all of our Great Lakes drinking water. Um, you know, so those kind of numbers we can get to fairly easily because they're already in a human context. But when we start talking about, um, the impact that they have on native species. And you have to ask, you know, what's the value of a Carner blue butterfly? What's the value of a native pitcher plant that exists only in this region and nowhere else in the world? That's very difficult to put in dollar and cents terms, you know, those kind of potentially irreversible losses of biodiversity. Um, worldwide, invasive species rank right next to habitat loss um, in terms of um, being the major cause of loss of biodiversity and species extinctions. So worldwide, you know, it's right up there at the top with climate change closing fast behind. Um, you know, you mentioned earlier about species being invisible and I don't think they're invisible. I think people don't necessarily recognize them. Um, you know, you mentioned, you know, going out there and you take a picture of a plant and then later find out that it was an invasive. Um, I think anybody driving through the state of Michigan is gonna see Phragmites in every road ditch. They may not know what it is. Um, and I'm gonna pick on Phragmites as kind of an example of some of these different kinds of impacts. It's a fire hazard. It's a viewing hazard that you have to mow out of road ditches so that you can see oncoming traffic, you know, or around corners. Um, it, you know, grows denser than native plants. So it affects duck habitat. The ducks can't get into nest. Um, you know, it, it has all of these different impacts. It can cause stagnant water. So then you have mosquito breeding ground, which can be an impact to human health. Um, so there's all of these kind of interacting impacts, some of which we can quantify and some of which are very difficult. And I, I guess I'll just add to the discussion. Um, you know, I think when it comes to invasive species, there's certain species that have very salient impacts, um, like as in the example of silver carp, they are the invasive carp that launch out of the water. So one of the potential you know, concerns about if they got in is that they're a risk to boaters because they can and, and will jump out of the water and, and at pretty impressive velocities and can hurt you. Um, but then there's also less salient impacts, which may be harder for um, the general public to kind of uh, visualize how that would impact them, impact them. So with the invasive carp, the big head and silver carp, you know, they're, they're going to be eating 
uh, the plankton that supports the, the, you know, the base of the food web. And so the risk associated with that is, um, you know, it, not only could it threaten the, um, our $7 billion recreational fishing industry in the Great Lakes, but, and, you know, it does that by, uh, you know, depleting this basal food source um, and, uh, you know, threatening the prey fish of these larger fish that people like to come to the Great Lakes to catch. Um, so I think that's just one of the difficulties also for people focusing on invasive species is uh, how do you communicate these um, less salient impacts to the public to, to um, demonstrate, demonstrate the severity or the possible severity of those impacts. You've all sort of touched on, on mussels, you know, zebra and quagga mussels as this key example of an invasive that has like fundamentally changed our ecosystem. Um, and I know I did a story on a study last year talking about how they have literally changed the chemistry of uh, Lake Michigan. Um, and I'm wondering, Doug, I know that that, you know, has a lot of implications for, for commercial fishers and tribal fishers. Can you speak to, you know, how the mussels have changed what it's like to be a tribal fisher? And um, how have, you know, folks in your tribe adapted to the threat? What does that look like? Yeah, uh, absolutely. Um, so uh, commercial fishing, subsistence fishing, you know, it's part of our community. Uh, we're a coastal community. We're located up here in the tip of the lower peninsula here. So Harbor Springs area, Petoskey area. Uh, so it's been part of our culture for, you know, millennia ever since, uh, for as long as we've been here. I, yeah, I think the, the big issue really for us that we're really looking at now um, is that impact to the food chain. Um, so quagga mussels have, again, you know, taken that energy and it's occupied now on the bottom of the lake. So it's been removed from that food column, from that water column. Um, and we were really noticing an impact to whitefish, oh, probably five, six years ago now, and really started to try to sound the bell on that and really work with our state and federal partners uh, to be aware that we're noticing a precipitous decline in uh, Lake Whitefish. Uh, originally, it was more or less attributed to uh, the fact that it seemed to be adult whitefish were predating on zebra mussels at the time and that they were having a hard time digesting that. Uh, we quickly soon did uh, decided to do a little bit more work in terms of trying to see what that uh, recruitment was. Uh, so we did a number of studies in terms of some beach saning uh, to try to find these young of the year um, that weren't really showing up in our surveys later. And it appears that that bottleneck for whitefish is really that early life stage. So after they hatch out, um, before they become about five to six inches, there really just isn't enough to eat for them at the right times of year. So we're really trying to do more work on, you know, trying to figure out that that bottleneck, you know, try to determine solutions. Uh, it's generally accepted that it's probably a direct result of quagga mussels, you know, removing uh, those nutrients from the water columns. So the uh, zooplankton, the phytoplankton just aren't there for that early life stage. Uh, so we're beginning to, to figure that out to a certain degree, uh, but we really you know, need a lot of assistance from all parties, including the state, including non-tribal, uh, non-government organizations, including the feds, uh, to really put some emphasis in research uh, to try to help identify solutions there. And for, for us, it was really something that we think uh, we need some of this younger, more innovative minds uh, to come forward and bring some of these tools um, to the table that are a little bit outside of the box. You know, tribes are good at being able to do some of that, at least promote some of that thought. Um, we don't have as what I like to call as much institutional inertia, where you're just kind of doing things uh, because you always have. Uh, so we're a little bit more nimble uh, to address some of these new threats. Uh, but whitefish specifically um, is one that we really need all hands on deck and have seen a direct impact to not only our commercial fishery, but even subsistence use of the resource, uh, whitefish are teetering. They're at the very top there. Um, they're kind of at the precipice and it's, a, it's very concerning. Um, so we're hoping that, you know, what would be some, some solutions? You know, I think we're, we're looking at a number of things, uh, but it's really trying to manage quagga mussels or maybe looking at different ways to uh, rear whitefish, maybe a hatchery type setting that could help get over that early life stage and get some of these uh, larger fish in the system. We have a small scale hatchery ourselves that is an experimental research facility 
Uh, so we've done work here recently in terms of learning how to rear cisco, which is a type of whitefish, very similar to lake herring, very similar to whitefish. And we've seen a rebound in cisco actually in Lake Michigan uh, here recently. And so we're hoping to take some of that work and maybe apply that uh, to whitefish as well. I'm curious, and I'm not sure who would be the best to answer this question. So can someone just jump in? But uh, is there any, you know, the mussels coat like the entire lake bed in, in many spots. Is there any hope that these things will decline or be eradicated at any point? Or is this something we now are living with forever? I can take that if nobody else wants to. Um, I don't hold up much hope for total eradication of the dry scented mussels, but I have learned to never say never. Um, but controlling numbers, um, maybe um, there's some great new research going on um, with genetic controls. There is research going on on a variety of different control technologies, everything from using remote operated vehicles um, to essentially go through the uh, small areas and vacuum up muscles. You know, those kind of technologies help more say in the immediate vicinity of a water intake or on a swimming beach. You know, they aren't gonna hit Great Lakes wide levels that we would really need for eradication. Um, but they can help a lot with some of those key impact points. Um, and so I, I guess I will leave that there um, and maybe help with critical habitat so that threatened native species don't go extinct. Yeah, and I guess I'll just, I share that same sentiment as Rochelle that I, you know, I, I think the eradication of an established invader is a very rare occurrence. In fact, I've, I think I've only ever heard of it occurring once for at least an aquatic mussel species. And it was like in an enclosed harbor of Australia. I don't remember all the details, but I'm not aware of any precedent where, a, um, you know, an invader as ubiquitous as the quagga mussels have been eradicated from, you know, an environment as large as the Great Lakes. So yeah, I don't, share too much hope in the fact that it, you know, I think they'll be here for the, at least the duration of our lifetimes. Yeah, I, I would, uh, I guess, maybe just offer a, a third point of view there, perhaps, I guess I'm going to be a little bit more optimistic. And, you know, there is some things out there that are being looked at. Um, and some of them can be quite controversial. So I think it really is something that we as a community um, that are managing the Great Lakes, states, tribes, federal government, really need to have some more discussion about. Um, there is potential for you know, gene modification um, as a way to you know, uh, affect the ability for quagga mussels to reproduce. Uh, CRISPR, those type of, type of technologies out there are evolving. Uh, there has been some work in regards to uh, you know, potential to identify cancers or certain other um, elements that are another natural type of uh, reaction uh, that could be applied to quagga mussel. You know, trying to address one a native or trying to address one species with another virus or cancer or that type of thing, um, you know, can be very tricky as well um, to control. We've seen horrible results um, from those types of similar endeavors in other places, not a virus or cancer, but trying to uh, utilize one species to control another species. Um, so th those are, you know, potential out there. And then I think the, the last one is if we can really, um, you know, maybe dedicate some time and maybe there's a vulnerable stage um, in the reproduction life of a quagga mussel uh, that we can target, similar to the advance with uh, lampricide. Um, you know, that really was a game changer for the Great Lakes in terms of controlling lamprey. Um, and there really hasn't been anything anywhere near that um, that's been as successful. But if we could develop a quaggicide, for example, that just impacts that early life history or part of the quagga mussel uh, process there, a reproduction process, you know, that might be something that would be uh, available and that we could see some significant change. Um, so, you know, there, I think these open up these broader management discussions, uh, but also are going to take some innovative thought that I was mentioning earlier that, you know, we're really hoping that we can push individuals uh, to really think innovatively, younger individuals that don't have a lot of thought inside the box, perhaps, or maybe people that aren't necessarily in natural resources altogether uh, to really help bring some of those innovative ideas out there. Uh, so we're hopeful, I'm hopeful anyways, that something can come along yet. 
So I think the muscles are a great example of like the cost once something has already invaded. And I know that um, there's been a lot of effort, you know, and especially in recent years on preventing the next invasion so that we're not constantly in response mode. Um, and Rochelle, you, you mentioned some stats that make it sound like there's been big progress there in terms of slowing the spigot of new species in. Um, can you speak to one, what has been done that's, that's led to that, that's led to that slowdown? And then maybe everyone can speak to how are these things still getting into our region? You know, what are the, the key vectors bringing these things in now? Sure. Um, so the, 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 this real slowdown is really a, a triumph of um, innovative partnership and control of ballast water. Um, that peak of invasion we saw in the 1990s was driven by ballast water invaders. Um, during that period, um, 70 to 80% of the invaders that came in were coming in with ballast. Um, so there was a, you know, a, a big push to, you know, what are we going to do about these invaders in ballast water? And we, in fact, developed new regulations for ballast water, open water exchange um, of water um, as ships would cross um, the ocean before entering the Great Lakes. So, you know, a, a ship that has picked up ballast, say, from a port in the um, North Sea or uh, in the Baltic or, you know, somewhere that's coastal that has fresh water. Um, when they get out to the middle of the ocean, they would dump out those ballast tanks and reload them with salt water. Well, the freshwater species that they've just dumped in the middle of the ocean aren't going to survive out in the ocean. They, they're going to die. Um, and then when they get to the Great Lakes and dump out the saltwater species in the Great Lakes, those are going to die because they can't survive in fresh water. And that really made a huge difference. Um, and then we had a, um, but we weren't seeing it at, like the total difference like immediately when that um, came into place. Um, and then, you know, researchers were like, well, why? And so they went out and, you know, were crawling in and out of ballast tanks trying to figure out where these things were still coming from and found that, you know, ships that have no ballast on board, which were exempt from treatment because we, you know, their tanks are empty. Um, but the tanks weren't actually empty. They had like an inch of sludge in the bottom of the tank. And so then when they'd come into the Great Lakes and, you know, stop at their first port of call, call and offload some cargo, they'd pull in some Great Lakes water um, and then discharge that um, at their next port of call when they loaded on cargo to take out of the Great Lakes. Um, that's where they were coming from. And as soon as that was discovered and that was started regulated in around 2006, first on the Canadian side and then US regulations pretty quickly caught up um, to stop that, we call it a loophole, but it wasn't like anybody was deliberately exploiting the loophole. We just didn't know. Um, and the shipping industry got on board very fast with control, um, you know, and just kind of flushing out those tanks while they were out in the ocean. Um, we really saw a very dramatic and almost instantaneous drop in the number of new invaders. So that was the cause for that. Um, and then the second part of your question, I'm going to blank and you're going to have to re-ask me. I was asking, how are these things still getting in here now? Obviously the rate has slowed, right. but they're still coming in, still right. spreading. Uh, what are the main modes now? So the main modes now um, from our data are um, what we call organisms in trade. So that's things like the garden plants, um, like hydrilla is an aquarium plant, water soldier was a garden plant. Um, you know, grass carp were sold, um, supposedly sterile triploids, um, but they were sold in the region to, you know, to control weeds in ponds. Um, so those things that were deliberately in trade, but supposedly, you know, in captivity, um, that would also include things like aquarium species. You know, somebody dumps their aquarium goldfish show up on a regular basis. Tropicals show up on a regular basis. 
we don't worry about the tropicals because they aren't going to survive our winters. But um, so that organisms of trade in the big is the big pathway. And then secondary to that, we have a group that we call hitchhikers on organisms and trade. And those are the things like parasites, diseases, small insects, small zooplankton that nobody is introducing deliberately, but they might be hitching along with say, you know, a fish parasite might be on your bait minnows. Um, the zooplankton, the couple that we had coming in recent years were known to be associated with the roots of aquatic plants. So they're hitchhiking in um, and that really gets to, you know, kind of the biosecurity protocols for um, the places that are trading in species. And you just mentioned um, many of these things, or, or at least some, if they're tropical, you know, they're not getting a foothold because our winters are, are too cold and they're dying. Um, and Peter, I want to ask you, because I think you've studied some of this, um, does that create new threats as our climate changes? Um, how, how will climate change impact invasive species and their ability to, to gain a foothold here? Uh, yeah, well, to, you know, just build on what Rochelle just said, our, our cold and harsh winters, um, no matter how much we might not like it sometimes, it, it's been an effective barrier against certain species, uh, non-native species from establishing in the lakes. With climate warming, we could, you know, expect that we're going to have these milder winters, which means that we're going to potentially, this barrier that was once protecting the lakes is no longer going to be as effective as it was. And so, um, you know, there's been studies that have shown certain species over winter survival is expected to increase in the Great Lakes with uh, climate warming. Um, now, my, my work or my study that I was a part of specifically looked at the effects of climate change on two of the species of invasive carp, the big head and silver carp, which are the ones, again, that eat plankton. Um, and what this research showed is well, it, what we did is we looked, developed a model to assess how suitable Lake Michigan is uh, to support the growth of these two fishes. Um, and we looked at how, they, how that would change in a warmer than average year that might become more typical of the climate um, by 2100. And what we found is essentially that climate change is gonna lengthen the growing season for these two species of fish. And it does this in two fundamental ways. It first will increase the temperature of water in the Great Lakes, um, which will allow these fish to feed more actively. Their uh, foraging is dependent on temperature. Um, and then it also changes, causes physical changes in the lake that will benefit the fish. So in the Great Lakes during the summer, when the waters heat up to a sufficient level, um, it, we undergo a process called stratification where the water column divides into two kind of distinct water masses, a warmer and less dense mass that sits on the top and a cooler, denser mass that sits on the bottom. And what this does is it restricts the movement of water from the top of the water column to the bottom. Now it only, it goes to the top of the top water column to that uh, dividing point of those two water masses. And this is cutting off muscles from food that exists at the top and then is used to be transported down in the spring. So with the lengthening of, we're, what we're gonna see is a lengthening of the summer stratification period, which means muscles will be cut off from this food resource or food resources longer, meaning there'll be more food available in the upper part of the water column for uh, fish like uh, the invasive carp. Um, so it, that, those are in general. So there's different ways that climate change can affect the suitability of the lake for uh, invasives, but um, you know the lengthening of summer stratification and potentially milder winters are ways that the lake could become more susceptible as a result of climate change. Is there an element there too of native, you know, fish and wildlife having a tougher time because they're adapted to the cold, or is that not as much of a concern? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, um, and others may have other opinions on this too, but there's, you know, fish are often uh, divided into what we call thermal gills. There's cold, cool water, and warm water fishes. Um, you know, it's expected that, that most, that climate change is going to benefit a lot of the warm water fishes of the Great Lakes, which we have some in the that are native, um, while um, being a little bit, being, having a negative impact on those cold water species. Um, so some of the trout, um, like native trout, like brook trout might, might be impacted. I don't know specifics of which species would be impacted most, but, 
um, in general, it would be benefit. It would probably bolster habitat for those warm, warm water species of which invasive carp belong. And yeah, I would, oh, I, would just, I would just add on to that that uh, yeah, it's, uh, certainly, um, you know, as the climate change. Um, warms the lakes. Uh, one of the things right now, uh, L wife, one of the things that prevents or keeps that population from exploding in addition to uh, predation um, is cold winters. So if we have less cold winters, then that population uh, will do better. So that's an invasive species um, in the Great Lakes. Uh, whitefish is at the very top. It's a native species at the top of its thermal range. So if the lakes warm up just a, a little bit more, uh, one to two degrees, uh, then that can really affect uh, whitefish. In addition to that, uh, whitefish and lake trout are fall spawners. So they lay their eggs near shore and really need to have uh, ice to protect uh, those eggs during the, the winter there um, in such that they're more viable in the spring. So if we have warmer winters with less ice and we have warmer winters with more severe weather, high waves, high wind, then that really batters uh, those near shore eggs uh, for our native species, which makes them you know, less likely to be reprodu uh, have reproduction or be successful there. Um, and there may be other invasives that benefit from that, but certainly those are other issues that are stressing those native populations. Are there any other sort of moving you know, targets in the lake other than climate change that either make them more or less, you know, hospitable to new invaders? So, Human activity. Oh, yeah. <laughs> like what? Go I, ahead, Peter. Well, I was just gonna, yeah, along those lines, uh, you know, we just were talking about essentially temperature as being this barrier, the winter temperatures here. Um, you can think of these, there's more than just temperature though that act as these filters that determines what species can survive and what can't. Um, you know, we have sometimes in smaller lakes, we see hypoxia form in the winter. Um, we also see hypoxia form in the summer that might deter certain species that are not tolerant to low oxygen levels. Um, also anything that changes river flow patterns, salinity levels, physical habitat, or the abundance of certain food items. Um, those are all things that, you know, if, if altered could infect, uh, could affect the susceptibility of an ecosystem. Um, like Rochelle just said, I think habitat alterations um, you know, could potentially, you know, um, like a channelization or shoreline armoring or just any kind of disruption that might confer competitive advantages to non-native uh, invaders uh, over some of the native um, species would be uh, examples. Um, you know, impoundments that slow the flow of rivers can uh, confer advantages to slow uh, species more adapted to slow moving waters compared to maybe native species that have evolved uh, to the historical flow regime of the river before it was impounded. Um, so that's just some examples. I yeah, leave. and then I would just add to that in terms of, you know, the actual invasion rates, um, human activity, you know, how much shipping is coming in, how much trade is going on, whether people are dumping aquariums, those can make a huge difference. Um, to this basically biosecurity of the Great Lakes. And one thing I would add on to that I think is uh, there can be a compounding um, factor also. Uh, we've not really seen that per se, uh, but one of the invasive species that we haven't really mentioned today that is uh, ubiquitous now and is a part of the ecosystem is ground gobies. Uh, so gobies now, you know, occupy a significant portion of the food web for native species. Um, and that can also, I think, potentially lead for non-native species, their non-native pred uh, predators uh, to come into the system and maybe establish themselves more readily in the future and then push out uh, those native species. So we have native species uh, that are eating some of these uh, invasives, quagga mussels uh, to a certain degree and gobies, but that's not their food source. And we also have, you know, evidence that some of these invasive species, L life specifically, has caused lake trout uh, to have a thiamine deficiency and affects their ability to reproduce 
um, outright altogether, and that's part of the collapse of, of lake trout. So these these other species not only are they occupying uh, portions of the food web and altering the environment, uh, but they can have real direct consequence on native species that predate on them, or simply they just don't have the ability to target those um, as efficiently as say a native uh, predator from their native region. Though they're trying to and they're eating them, they're still not getting the nutrients that they need out of them. And so they're you know emancipated. Um, our lake whitefish used to have really robust round humps and uh, were um, you know, significantly larger. Now we've seen that those lake whitefish are of the same length, but they're underweight. Uh, they don't have that same fitness. Um, and that's again, part of this food web. They're surviving, they're reproducing to a certain degree once they get to a larger age, uh, but they're not really eating and getting the nutrients that they need because all that's out there you know, are these invasive species um, and they're not uh, well suited or you know you know evolved to be a, a good food source so so i'm curious and I, i'm going to go to reader questions after this because we've got a few coming in but what policies or just strategies are we not doing right now that that uh, I'll, I'll start with um doug that you think could help slow that spread even further Yeah, I think one of the things that uh, you know we tried to look at from a um, tribal perspective in terms of management uh, is that you know we we look to be nimble and innovative, um, and so I think that's one of the things that definitely can help is really uh, not limiting our solutions to ones that we've uh, agreed upon or recognized early on. Um, so to really look at some of these innovative ways to approach these subjects here. Um, but also for us is, is trying to look long term. Um, tribal governments, organizations, communities really have a seven generation approach. So they're trying to look, you know, what in what things we do now, how that impacts generations down the road. So typically seven generations. So that can mean that you may need to have sacrifice now for this current generation in order to benefit a future generation or that you have to have a, a higher cost now or put away uh, aside some you know, instant gratification. So I think you know, really trying to embrace that there may be things that we can do now that aren't being put on the table from a cost perspective or potentially an impact to this current generation that really would be for the betterment of the lakes mm -hmm. overall or of future generations. Uh, so really trying to have some of those you know, discussions there, not just looking at the generation right now or impacts right now in terms of how those costs or how those uh, effects may be for this specific generation, but what's best for the resource overall and what's best for those future generations. Rochelle, I see you're unmuted. Do you have thoughts on that too? Oh, sorry, I was just leaving myself unmuted, but oh. I would say, um, you know, we focused on prevention, and I think rightly so, and have done a pretty good job, at least within the ballast water framework. Now that we're discovering other vectors that are still in play, um, we need to get serious with some of those. Um, I think spread between lakes has been largely overlooked in favor of just, you know, here's the Great Lakes, it's either here or it's not. Um, and starting to look at those subtleties of, you know, how does a species move from Lake Ontario to Lake Huron? And are there controls we could put in place? Um, lake or ballast, so the, the ships that never leave the Great Lakes, but, you know, transit back and forth between Superior and Ontario um, are currently completely unregulated. So um, that's one potential area to look. Um, you know, bait has a bait now has a lot of thanks thanks to some of the recent invaders that we discovered. Um, uh, thinking particularly with VHS, people have gotten much more serious about bait fish as a vector um, in the region. Um, I think getting the public involved. Some of the citizen science efforts are great. Some of the efforts. Um, you know, the, the messaging about not dumping your bait, not dumping your aquarium. Um, if it's fine to have exotic pets and, you know, 
cool plants in your water garden, but then you're responsible for making sure those don't get out into the environment. Um, those kind of citizen and educational campaigns are going to be a critical part um, of solutions long term. And then the cool new technologies that are coming online that, you know, hopefully th those out of the box innovative things. And Peter, do you have thoughts on that? I know a lot of your world is on the, the carp issue and the carp that are in the Mississippi, but a threat to the Great Lakes if they get here. Uh, yeah, I guess I have a few sh short um, add-ons. So, you know, from my experience, um, you know, I, I, I've seen, I, it seems that the coordination among the states is pretty good, the communication and public messaging. Um, one thing I, 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 you know, I think would be ideal uh, it is if the Great Lakes states and the province of Ontario had uh, uniform regulations on certain species. Uh, I think sometimes you'll see one states or four states regulate one species, but then four of the others don't. Uh, this seems to create, you know, a weak link situation in my mind. Um, so I think that would be one way to kind of shore up and really um, reinforce prevention efforts uh, and give it some regulatory teeth. And I'm gonna kick this one to Doug because I you were talking about lamprey earlier. Um, someone, one of the readers says, I would appreciate any updates and thoughts on lamprey prevalence and control versus dam removal to reestablish connectivity for native and beneficial aquatic, aquatic wildlife and stream function. Yeah, so that's a that's a real challenge. Um, those lower most barriers uh, really are essential. Uh, for a majority of the streams in Michigan to prevent lamprey from getting up into that. Uh, so quagama, or so lamprey are uh, uh, addressed through lampicide, which is a treatment that U.S. Fish and Wildlife uh, administers here as through uh, uh, working for the U.S. or for the uh, Great Lakes Fisheries Commission. So they're, they're not hitting every stream, nor are they hitting all streams of all sizes. It's a calculated effort there. So there's a rotation from larger streams uh, your more predominant or your bigger producers of sea lamprey are targeted. And then there's a rotation of those and some smaller streams aren't treated at all um, because they don't view them as being a contributor. If you remove some of those lowermost dams on some of those uh, streams, uh, then you have that potential to open up just more habitat for sea lamprey, um, which causes this, this dilemma here. Um, generally speaking, removing those, yeah, does increase uh, you know, native habitat for some of your indigenous strains, uh, but also creates an opportunity for some of your recently, your naturalized, if you will, um, strains to get in there as well. So salmon, uh, uh, steelhead, you know, those are not native species and they can have impact on some of those remnant uh, species, specifically in brook trout. Uh, so it can be uh, tricky. Uh, there is some technology out there though that is looking at, um, you know, inflatable barriers or seasonal barriers. Uh, that could be put in place on specific um, streams, specific lowermost barriers that would allow for this naturalization of the river, uh, but then be deployed at certain key times in the year, spring typically, uh, when sea lamprey are reproducing to still prevent them from getting up into these, you know, these larger reaches of the streams here. Um, so it, it's, a, it's difficult, it's a complicated discussion there. Um, sea lamprey are, are a real problem, yeah, and in increasing habitat or creating more habitat um, while creating additional habitat for native species uh, is more of a system by system discussion, really uh, should involve the community, um, but has these larger ramifications as well. So, and um, we have another, I think, a teacher in the chat says, uh, my students are curious what solutions are practiced to treat or stop the spread of zebra mussels in inland lakes in Michigan. And, you know, obviously they're pretty widespread across our state, but we do have some inland lakes that don't have them, right? So what is being done to try to keep it that way? Um, I'm wondering maybe, Rochelle, do you have thoughts? This is why I don't mute myself because it takes me forever to find the unmute button. Um, there's a lot being done. Um, primarily, it comes down to um, citizen education, boat wash stations. 
the main vector by which um, zebra and quagga mussels are getting into the inland lakes. And for the inland lakes, it's really a zebra mussel problem more so than quagga mussels that like the really deep water. Um, is that they're hitchhiking on boats. Um, they're hitchhiking on aquatic plants occasionally, but really that boater traffic is the main one. And so the boat washing stations are a big deal. Um, and the, the state of Michigan, I, I'm sorry, I don't have the facts and figures on how many boat washing stations they put out every year. You know, signage um, saying which lakes, you know, this lake is not infested with zebra mussels, please wash your boat before launching versus um, some lakes have signage that says, this lake is infested with zebra mussels, please wash your boat before you leave. Um, those kind of things make a huge difference um, in how fast it spreads. You know, Michigan's got like 15,000 inland lakes and really it's only a small fraction of those that are infested with zebra mussels so far. Um, so we have a lot that's still worth protecting. We have another person, and I think it was Peter who made this point. So I'll ask you, um, this, this listener says, there was mention of sometimes inconsistent measures within the Great Lakes states. Uh, are we coordinating or seeking cooperation with Canada to try to be more consistent? Um, so my, to my knowledge, yeah, there's coordination and communication with Canada. Obviously there's no, um, we can't make Canada do anything that they, they're their own, obviously sovereign country. Um, but yes, you know, there's a panel meet, aquatic nuisance species panel meetings, I believe, where there's opportunities to commun mm -hmm. with, communicate um, with state and province partners. Um, and that gives opportunities for them to communicate and coordinate efforts there. But Rochelle would know more about that than myself. Yeah, so the Great Lakes panel on aquatic nuisance species meets twice a year. Um, with various committees meeting in between. Um, I sit on a lot of those committees um, to help provide information and to make sure that we're getting um, the information. Those So it, it includes the state agencies, it includes the federal agencies on both the US and Canada, the two pro provinces. Tribes are in, have representation, the First Nations in Canada have representation, and then it, there's a lot of stakeholder groups that are represented as well. Um, and so there's a lot of talk um, on coordination, um, but each state still has that authority to set their own regulations and it is a patchwork. Um, within Glances, we have a, a section of our website called the Risk Clearinghouse and we've just launched um, last winter a new uh, widget developed by one of our staff um, that lets you look at, you know, type in a species name and you can find out what the regulations are in each jurisdiction. And there's only a handful that are prohibited in all jurisdictions. Um, so it really is, you know, species by species, very much a patchwork that we're still dealing with. And I think we're running out of time, but I'm going to really quickly ask one last question before I um, send it back to Catherine to close us out. I keep thinking about something an advocate said to me the other day when I asked, you know, sort of what, is, what are your biggest concerns around invasives for the future? And he said, one is the, is the idea that complacency could creep in and that, you know, um, the sense people will have this sense that, you know, there's nothing we can do. So we should just live with um, the encroachment of more and more invasives. I'm curious, you know, for the, the three of you who sort of live and breathe this every day, do you think it's possible to fully, you know, turn off the spigot? Um, or are we just living with this at this point? Um, I guess I'll add, uh, I'll answer, give my opinion. It's, I think this invasive species is just gonna be a symptom of living in a globalized connected world. Um, as long as we're, you know, you know, exporting and importing from other uh, sides of the world, there's gonna be a risk that species from those areas will be transported here and species from here will be transported there. Um, so this is, uh, yeah, I think it's gonna be a constant, it's a, it's a constant battle because of that. Um, and it's, yeah. I'll agree. I, I think I think we're, it's it's going to be a constant battle. I'm not sure that zero is the real target, and that's a somewhat controversial statement. 
I, I would like to see us get away from that all or nothing mentality of, oh, if it gets in, now give up. Because I think, you know, it's, it's a staged process. A species gets in, it may or may not establish, it may or may not, you know, expand and spread to other areas. It may or may not have impacts. Um, and I, so I think there's all these different levels um, at which we need to start thinking beyond just the it's in or it's not. Um, and I think as we start looking at some of those more subtle things, we start to see that no, everything we do can help make a difference. It's, you know, you know, if, if a species gets in, you know, say water soldier just hit um, Bay of Quinty. Well, if we can stop it in the Bay of Quinty, that's better than it hitting all five Great Lakes, and, you know, and hitting eight states and two provinces. Um, you know, so controlling that and then control, we're starting to see places like sea lamprey. It's been here a very long time. We're going to be battling it forever. I don't, I could hope, but I'm not really hopeful that we'll ever eradicate it. But we can keep those populations in check to the point with, where it's not totally devastating a $7 billion fishery. Um, you know, it, it's an ongoing battle to keep these things in check and to weigh the costs and the benefits. Or to weigh the cost of control versus the cost of doing nothing. And Doug, what's your last words on that before I hand it over to Catherine? Uh, yeah, you know, I think there's uh, definitely it's going to take some vigilance. Um, you know, I hope that we don't have to move into a space where we just learn to to live with them, um, because that could mean learning to live with a completely altered and different in, you know, ecosystem and environment. Um, and that would be, you know, foreign to us uh, and it would, uh, I think, affect our quality of life here, uh, in addition to our economy and those types of things. So that that vigilance um, and I, I think, you know, trying to encourage people uh, to stick with that vigilance, but also encouraging these other innovative ways of managing um, cooperation. Uh, that's going to take the Great Lakes states and Canada to really cooperate in terms of management. I think there's room to strengthen that uh, to degree, but also looking at some of these other innovative ways uh, to approach those those issues that we have now as far as invasive species and their presence. Um, and maybe we do reach an equilibrium. And it's really only been you know within our generation, uh, you know, the last 50 years that we've experienced this explosion of uh, invasive species here. Uh, so the next 50 years, uh, can we reach an equilibrium? Um, can we back you know, move backwards a little bit in some of these other areas? And, keep some of our native species in our current environment intact. Um, yeah, I'm gonna remain hopeful. I think that we can. Well, thank you all. And I'm gonna um, pass the mic to my colleague, Catherine Dougal to close us out. Catherine, I just want to let you know, I think you're muted. I'm totally muted, everyone. Thank you again for joining us today. Um, and a special thank you to Doug and Rochelle and Peter and Kelly for this exciting conversation. I know that we didn't get to everyone's questions today, but these conversations always help inform our reporting. And I'm sure that our partners at Circle of Blue, this will give them some interesting fodder for their reporting as well. I also wanna thank again, the Herb Family Foundation and the Bosch Foundation for supporting this series and to welcome all of you to join us for our next discussion on May 11th. Thank you again and have a great afternoon.